now turn to the Word of God, and I invite you to follow along on the screen, in your bulletin, or of course in your Bible, but first you can have a seat. (laughs) We have the entirety of Psalm 1 as our passage this morning. Hear now God's Word. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. We are in a series called Summer in the Psalms. And we're looking at, for the next 11 weeks, well, 10 weeks, actually, week one was last week, we're looking for uh, a number of, we're going to read a number of different psalms, um, and we're going to help to uh, experience what it means, truly, to to pray and to um, understand the prayer book of the Bible. The Psalms are right smack dab in the middle of your Bible. There are 150 of them, and they are an absolute treasure trove of human emotions and experiences. From the highest joys of intimate communion with God and the overflowing joy of being uh, uh, connected with God to, to the depression and despair of feeling abandoned by Him. From the soul-crushing pain of regret over sin, to the boiling fury caused by the betrayal of those who the psalmist trusted, to the deep gratitude for the wondrous world in which we live, to the humble dependence upon God's word, the full range of human experiences and emotions are on display in the psalms. The word psalm comes from the Greek psalmos. Does anyone know what that means? It means song. So the psalms were meant to be sung. We were meant to sing them out together, and they were really written for the congregation of God's people, and we will be looking at them together. I picked out, as I said, 11 of them. I I hope to represent a sample of the range of all of the topics that the psalms take up, and this morning we are going to look at the very first one, the one that kicks off and sort of sets, frames out the rest of the 149 psalms that follow. Let's pray first and then we'll take a look. Father, we are grateful this morning for many things. We thank you that we can come and freely worship. We thank you that you have given us warm beds to sleep in. You've given us food to eat this morning. You have blessed us in so many ways, too many ways to count, even since we have uh, woken up, and so we are grateful to you for for many, many blessings. Lord, we also recognize that there are um, those brothers and sisters among us who are having a very hard time right now, who are struggling with uh, various griefs and sorrows. Uh, we know that there are people out in the world who are having a, a very hard time, and we want to uh, we want to offer ourselves as your people who um, we want you to use in the world among uh, one, an- one another, in each other's lives, and also in the world at large to shine your light. And so we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to equip us to understand your word and to apply it to our lives. And we pray that as we look at this very first psalm in, in the entire Psalter, 150 of them, we pray that you would help us to understand it so that we might uh, better understand what, what follows and so that we might glorify you in our lives. So be with us, Lord, we pray. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 1. Um, it's been called the summary of the entire book of Psalms, all 150 of them summarized in this first one. There's a, a church father, his name was Basil, in the 4th century, and this is the way he put it. He said, what the foundation is to a house, 
The keel, here, here's the foundation of a house, very important. The keel to a ship, that's the thing there. That, now, this ship is not in a good place, but uh, if the water rose, then what the keel does is it balances out the ship and makes sure it doesn't fall over. So he says what the foundation is to a house, the keel to a ship, the heart to an animal. You might have a cat, you might have a dog, you might not have either and be very blessed to not have them. I would prefer not to have either, and I have both. But at any rate, what the foundation is to a house, the keel to a ship, the heart to an animal, the same is this psalm to the whole book of psalms. So it really frames all of them. And if you look at the very first word in Psalm 1, it's blessed. That Hebrew word is ashar or asher. Have you heard of that as, as a name of, of uh, a man, uh, asher? It means blessed or happy. And what this psalm is going to tell us about is how to be happy in our lives. That's the most valuable information we could have. Because Everyone wants to be happy, and I'm not talking about the shallow happiness that only lasts for a little bit. I'm talking about the deep happiness, the, the joy in life that all of us want. Indeed, that I think everyone who is alive wants, and we, we all want to be happy. Uh, there's a, a philosopher in the um, 17th century, his name was Blaise Pascal. And this is what he said. I think he's right. He said that all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and others avoiding it is the same desire in both attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. Everyone wants to be happy. We all want to avoid misery and enjoy happiness in life. And most of what we do in our lives is either leading us toward happiness or toward misery. And so this psalm is going to set up what the rest of the psalms say and is going to teach us what it means to strive for happiness. And the psalmist begins with what not to do. So he begins um, with blessed is the man and then what not to do if you want to be blessed. So the first part of this is uh, the method for misery, the method for misery. And we're going to look at three different um, statements in the very first verse. But before we do that, I want to explain a little bit about Hebrew poetry, uh, the Old Testament poets relied very heavily upon a literary device known as parallelism, okay, parallelism. And parallelism is, um, it's hard to say, parallelism is a method of explaining very colorfully the same truth over and over and over from a different angle or just with more rich and colorful language. So we, we might, to, to use it today, we might say the car is fast and that says something that's easy to understand, but we, we might expand it by saying the car is like lightning on wheels. The car is a cheetah on the hunt, and that fills out what it means that the car is fast. And Jesus knew the Psalms. I mean, he spoke them when he ministered, when he taught, even when he was on the cross. And Jesus used this kind of parallelism over and over in Matthew chapter 7 he says for with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged now we understand that but then he goes on and says and with the measure you use it will be measured to you so he uses parallelism just a few verses later ask and it will be given to you is that where he ends no what does he say seek and you shall find very good and then he says Knock and it will be open to you. So Jesus uses this device, this way of teaching, and that's what we're going to find in Psalm 1, verse 1. And there are these three different and kind of progressive images that all build toward the same thing. It says that one method for misery is walking in the counsel of the wicked. And this would be to heed the advice 
or direction of people who are going to tell you to do things that are evil, that are sinful, that are wicked. Sometimes these people are close to you. Sometimes they're your good friends or your family, and we have to use discernment. And the, the basic measure of discernment is, is simply if someone is telling you to do something that is counter to what the Word of God says, you shouldn't listen to them. It's as simple as it gets. And so we don't want to walk in the counsel of the wicked. Neither should we stand in the way of sinners. Now, I, I want you to picture the metaphor. Someone is walking along, walking maybe the path of, of following the living God. And, and here's you know, somebody counseling them to, to do that which is wicked. And so maybe they, they're, they're listening as they're walking. And then as they're walking, they stop. And now they're standing with sinners. They're not just walking by them. They're standing and hanging out with them. So that's the, the metaphor that, that gets more intensified. So these are people that you are around, that you spend time with, who are doing things that are counter to what God commands of us. And I, I want you to remember that sin does not just want part of you. Sin wants all of you. And usually, when we go down the path of sinfulness, it, it's, it's not this immediate light switch. It is a gradual, slow, we're walking, we slow down, and then we're standing with people who are doing things that are counter to what God commands of us. And we are supposed to fight our sin, to do battle with our sin. First Peter chapter 2 says that we are to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Why? Because they wage war against our souls. And it might not feel like it in the moment, but they're waging war against our souls. And so we want to be careful. And because people are doing what, what is easier and, and what, what everybody else approves of, it is easy for us to go along with it. Now, are we supposed to be friends with those who are not Christians, with those who are living a life that is counter to the word of God? Of course we are. But over and over, the Bible teaches that we ought to be careful who our friends are and that we ought to have believing brothers and sisters in Christ who are close to us, who can do two things, encourage us and challenge us when we're not walking on the path we ought to be walking on. So those two things. We need brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, says, bad company corrupts good morals. And so we, we use caution. We, and, and I've seen this happen in, in our church, and it's, it's, a, it's a sad thing. I, I can think of several uh, married couples who are divorced, and at least, part, now I don't, I don't, nobody has a full window into something like this, and there are all kinds of circumstances, but I know at least part of it was the company that was kept. And they had, their, their main friends were other couples who were doing things that, that were not honoring to God, and they were, that, was their, that was their friend group, and it led them to do things that were um, self-destructive. And so we, we, we want to be careful. We, we don't want to walk in the counsel of the wicked. It says we ought not to stand in the way of sinners. And sooner or later, if we keep standing, we will sit. And we will sit down with those who are leading us away from the living God. To sit in the seat of scoffers. Do you know what a scoffer is? It is someone who is just too cool for school. And they, everything is to be made fun of. Earnestness is something to make a joke out of. How could you believe what the Bible teaches? Give me a break. A scoffer is someone who sees through everything, but you know what the problem is? As G.K. Chesterton said, if you see through everything, you end up what? Seeing nothing. You don't see anything. And so a scoffer is someone who just has that attitude figured everything out, you can't teach them anything, and um, 
before you know it, that is the progression. You're walking, you stop, and you stand, and before you know it, you are sitting with scoffers who make fun of the Christian types who are so uptight and so bigoted and phobic and mean-spirited and judgmental and narrow-minded. And, and that's, that's the, the rap. And remember, um, Satan will portray this as actually the opposite of what it is. That it's actually freeing and liberating. And it is actually the, the opposite. It is the method for misery. But good news, good news. In Psalm 1 is not just the method for misery, but the blueprint for blessing in verse 2. And it simply says, His delight is in the law of the Lord, first of all. If you want to be truly happy, if you want to be happy, then delight yourself in the law of God. Uh, the longest psalm in, in the, the 150 psalms is Psalm 119. It is the longest chapter in the Bible. It is 176 verses. And almost all 176 of those verses are about delighting in the law of God. Here are just two of them. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. Do you feel consumed with the longing for rules? That just doesn't seem to fit, does it? I mean, I don't know. I, like, it, it just, it's hard to delight in the rules of God. Most of us don't delight in rules of any kind. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I mean, a lot of us, we think that rules are for the other people, right? And, and C.S. Lewis actually brought this up, and he, he articulated it very well. Um, he, he said this, I can understand that a man can and must respect these statutes and try to obey them. But it is very hard to find how they could be, so to speak, delicious. Surely it could be more aptly compared to the dentist's forceps than to anything enjoyable and sweet. With all due respect to you dentists and endodontists and so on out there. Uh, but Lewis, he, he had a hard time understanding how you delight in the laws of God. And the way that he um, came around to, to trying to understand it is... Is he, he said that, you know, in, in life, if you decide that you are going to live by your own rules and you're just going to do whatever you want to do and you're walking down a path, it is rather like walking, you, you see a shortcut, you think it's a shortcut, and so you start walking the shortcut and it's not really a path and, and, and the, more, the further you go, it gets a little muddy and then it gets a little more muddy and before you know it, you're in a swamp and you're trudging through, and there's mosquitoes biting you, and you can barely take one step after the other. And that's really what life is like if we are living by the rules that we want to make up. Conversely, when you get on the path of the, the commandments of God, and brothers and sisters, we are not saved by our, our obedience. We can't. We, we often go into the swamp, don't we? And, and we need a savior, and Jesus came to rescue us by grace. We are saved by grace. But that does not mean, then, that we go off into the swamp whenever we want because we've been saved, of course. It, it means that the law of God is actually doubly relevant to our lives because we want to please God. We want to, we want to obey Jesus. And so, so what C.S. Lewis said is it's actually like getting out of the the muck and the mud of the swamp and getting on a firm path. You have something firm under your feet. You know where it's taking you and where you're going. And, and that is what the law of God is like. And that is why you and I would delight in it. Because therein, actually, in the laws of God, in the teachings of Christ, in applying what Christ has taught us and what the Old and New Testament teaches us to our lives, we actually have freedom there. It's not in the swamp. The swamp promises freedom and ends us in bondage. I mean, we, we are a slave then to whatever our whims are, whatever our emotions are, whatever we feel like at a, on a particular day. Whereas if we are following the law of God and we're delighting in the law of God, we know where we are going. We have a vision for our lives. And the other thing that we're commanded to do is not just delight in the law of God, we're, we're commanded to meditate 
on his law day and night. And I, um, I, I want to just talk a little bit about this. How do we meditate on God's law? Well, we meditate on God's law by thinking about it regularly and putting it in our minds to consider. It's very easy for us to think about all kinds of different things, isn't it? I mean, aren't our minds, when we're not, I don't know, listening to a podcast or watching something or in a phone conversation, if we're just quiet, our minds tend to wander all over the place. And those are precisely the times when, when meditating on God's word helps us. And we're called and commanded to meditate on God's word, to think about it, to consider it. And so to do this very practically would be to take, I don't know, say Psalm 1 and read it through. And then for the rest of the day to just have it in your mind. Like what are, what are the ways, are there ways that I'm, I'm you know, walking or standing or sitting with, with sinful habits and patterns? Or, or am I delighting in the word of God properly and and it, it's, it's to think about it, to meditate is to think about it over and over and to chew on God's word. You know how cows digest their food, right? It's kind of gross, but they, they eat grass and they're called ruminant animals. And they swallow it and it goes into one of the chambers of their stomachs and, um, and then they, they, they let it ferment in the juices of their stomach and then what do they do? They bring it back up, and they chew on it, and they keep chewing on it, then they swallow then they bring it back up from a different chamber, and um, you may want to check, fact check me, but I, I think that's how it works, because <laughs> this is not my expertise, but I think that's how it works, and, and that's a great metaphor for us with the Word of God, that we would read it, and then we would bring it back up, and we would think about it in our minds, and we would try to better understand it, to meditate on God's word, and um, there's one more thing that we can do, and that is to memorize God's word. To memorize God's word is an amazing, amazing gift, and this year, for me, I have had a, a pretty revolutionary change in my life, and I've joined in with a handful of folks who are memorizing the book of First Peter, and we're finishing up chapter 2. That's 50 verses, 25 in chapter 1, 25 in chapter 2. Never thought I could do it for 20 years. I've been trying to memorize and just hammer it in my mind, and it doesn't work very well. But we have a song that we're memorizing with it, and it, these other methods, and and it's revolutionizing my thought life because I'm meditating on God's word more and more regularly. And, and um, I encourage you to, to try that, to just to try it and to look at different methods of memorizing because that's a way we can meditate on God's word. If we want to be happy, we will delight in God's word and we will meditate on it day and night. When we wake up at night and we can't sleep, raise your hand if you've woken up recently and you can't sleep in the middle of the night. Raise your hand if that's a regular occurrence for you. It's a wonderful thing to wake up in the middle of the night and to think about God's word and then to allow that to cause us to drift off to sleep or to begin our day at 2 a.m. Because why not? Some of us do that. Um, at any rate, there is a fork in the road. And, I, and Psalm 1 wants to teach us that there is one way or another to live our lives. There is no middle path. There is a fork in the road. And we either go one way or we go the other. And obedience to God is difficult. All of us have all kinds of ways that we are confronted with the word of God and that we are commanded to obey. It's not just those people out there. It is within us. Judgment always begins in the household of God. And so we ought to look first and foremost at ourselves. And where is the fork in the road? And are we following the path? Are we delighting in and meditating on the word of God? Which path will we take? And Psalm 1, in verses 3 through 6, it closes with um, some, some pretty interesting metaphors that help us understand this. Because uh, it says in verse 6 that the Lord knows the way of the righteous. That means he knows you, brother, sister in Christ, as you are striving to stay on that path toward God and obey his word. He knows you. He knows you through his son Jesus. He, he sees you as 
as right in his eyes, even if you aren't yet fully made right and you won't fully be made right until you stand before him after you die or, or when Jesus returns, whichever one comes first. But, but he sees you. He knows the way of the righteous, but then it says that the way of the wicked will perish. That there is a fork in the road. There are two different ways. And he who is blessed is like a tree planted by streams of water. And this is more like a lake, but it was the closest I could find. This is, this is a tree. That, and and I, I love the metaphor of the tree because um, a tree is very slow growing. You know, you don't see it from month to month, the progress that it's making. It takes years. But, but a tree is also very strong. And it's got, it's got thick bark, you know, thick skin. And what does it say? That it, 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 if you trust in the word of God and you obey the word of God, then when the drought comes, you'll be okay. Do you know the metaphor that Jesus used years later in the New Testament that totally reminded me of this as I was studying it? It's, it's where, where do you build your house, you know? If you build your house on the rock, it's not that storms will not come. They will come for every one of us. But if you build your house on the rock, you will be able to withstand the storm. And if you build your house on the sand, you will not be able to withstand. And this is a, a similar metaphor. If you are... If you are a tree and you're planted in the middle of nowhere and there's no, there's no water, then, you, then, then when the drought comes, you'll die. If you are planted by streams of water, the word of God, you will survive. And then it says it yields its fruit in its season. This speaks to maturity in Christ. You will bear fruit if you continue to follow Christ and, and little by little obey him more and more. You will bear fruit. And... You know, it says that um, the wicked are not like that. It says that the wicked are like chaff. And here's a picture of, of wheat and then a picture of chaff. And the chaff is very, very light. It's the, it's the husk around the valuable grain. And here's a picture of, um, of a farmer separating the wheat from the chaff. And the chaff, is, it's very, very light. And once it is separated from the grain... Where does it go? Nobody, nobody knows where it goes because it's so light and insignificant that, that you don't even, you don't see where it goes and it's just, it's gone. It's gone. And once it is, once the grain is harvested, it has no nutritional value. It says um, that the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. This, this is an indication of the final judgment. And um, over and over again, the Bible warns that there are two ways. There's either the way of Jesus or the way of death. And Jesus uses metaphors that are very, very similar. He, he talks about in Matthew 13, the wheat in the weeds, where there's a, a crop growing up and there's some weeds in it and there's wheat. And the helpers say to the master, should we pull all the weeds now? And the master says, no, wait till the end. We'll harvest everything, and then we will separate the weeds from the wheat. You, you probably know, uh, you may have heard this other story that Jesus told about the final judgment, about the sheep and the goats, where they will be separated one from the other. And um, there are harsh words from Jesus. Depart from me. I never knew you, is the warning that he gives. Psalm chapter 1 is a very similar warning to that. And we need to understand what this warning is. It is a warning to stick to the word of God. No matter what your peers are doing, no matter what your friends say, no matter what the world says, stick with and trust the word of God. We are called by grace. We, we cannot earn our salvation by um, memorizing verses or by trying to be as obedient, earning, earning God's love through our works and through being obedient to his word. But we can actually please him as his sons and daughters as we walk with him and as we strive to obey his word. And that's what Psalm 1 is a call to do. It is a 
It is a very, very gracious warning for what is in fact coming. Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment. Judgment is coming. And there is a bright, clear line of demarcation between those who trust in God's word, especially the living word of God, Jesus himself, and those who reject God's word. And the difference between those who trust God's word and those who do not over a lifetime ought to become clear. Those who love Jesus and who obey his word are filled more and more with the fruit of the spirit, with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That's what we are to, to, to be to the world, including those who are lost, who need the gospel. And so how do we do that? We do that by simply obeying God's word, by delighting in his law and meditating on it day and night. And I want to just close with this last um, sentence in verse 3 where it says, in all that he does, he prospers. I want to just say what this means and what it doesn't mean. It does mean that if you obey God's word and you trust in his word and you listen to it and you try to follow it, you, you will be blessed. You will be happy because you will invest your life wisely. What it does not mean is that everything will go perfectly for you. And we know this, amen? We know this through dear brothers and sisters who suffer greatly uh, by our side, who, who have lost incredibly, um, just who have lost so much. So this does not mean that we will get everything we want. It does not mean we will be protected and shielded from suffering. It means that as we build our house on the rock, it will withstand those terrible calamities that face many, many of us, if not all of us. So brothers and sisters, delight in the word of God. Meditate on his word day and night. And you and I, we will be blessed. We will be happy. We will be joyful in the Lord. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you so much that you are clear. And they're, they're, we just sang, what, what more could you say than has already been said in your word? And, of course, all of us would, would love to know more. But everything that we need is to be found in your word. Lord, I pray that you would give us clarity on what this psalm teaches us that it does not teach us that we are saved by our obedience to your word. We, we cannot obey your word fully. We desperately need your son, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that you came and, and you died for our sins and you paid for our sins and that the justice of God against sinners was satisfied at the cross and then you rose from the dead and you invite us all through your conquering power over death and sin and hell to come to you to repent of sins, and to trust in you. And Lord, I pray that anyone who is here who does not know you would repent of sins and trust in you. And Lord, then when, when we become your children by faith, when we are born again, when your spirit moves in us and turns us from death to life, something we could never do on our own, you actually command us to obey your word. And I pray that every single one of my brothers and sisters, that we would all together strive to humbly obey your word. Help us, Lord, to actually delight in your word. To not consider your word like forceps at the dentist's office, but to consider your word as an absolute delight, as it says in Psalm 119, as honey to our tongues. Father, we pray that we would meditate on your word day and night, and that the result of, of knowing and loving and delighting and meditating on your word would be that we are people who shine the light and the love of Christ to the world and help us to know how to do that. Help us to know how to speak the truth in love. Help us to know how to love sinners without affirming sin. Lord, all of that is difficult for us. And so we ask for wisdom and help in that. Help us to be steadfast. Help us to have the courage to trust your word. 
And Lord, we want to lift up to you those who are in the midst of tremendous storms. And, and Lord, I pray that, that you would help them to withstand the pain and the grief and to trust you through it. Hear us now, Lord, as we pray according to how Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.